the program was done by the whole team, different folks. Uh, it's just we decided it would be simpler to, to have one presenter for this. Uh, future sessions probably won't be me as the presenter, it'll be other personalities. We have stuck with the core package in what we're going to show today. Primarily, there are a couple of things that branch slightly into a couple of optional modules that are well adopted, but primarily our focus today is the DAC core system uh, that everybody uses. We tried to, to stick with that. So having said all that, let's see if I can uh, make things work here. So I'm going to jump ahead and your screen should have changed. And uh, if you, so here's a couple things we're going to present. So let me just pop something over here and we'll just jump right in. All right, so here we are on one of our test systems. Pretty restricted data set. Hopefully everybody can see that screen okay. And if things uh, do not look right on your end, just hit me in Teams and I'll see a message pop up in there. Otherwise, I'm just going to take off and go. So first thing we wanted to cover, something new to everybody except possibly one customer, and that's the, the notion of being able to rank customers based off of behavior. And uh, actually, the nuts and bolts phase one went out in the uh, shortly after our last release, I believe. Also, I should talk about some things on the screen here before we jump deeper in. These are patch numbers up here that I'm showing, like the 11896 is a piece of work. That is a, a work task. And when it was done, and you'll see navigational things in there, but that's the way we the way we organize our workflow at CDR. So if you see something that you want in there before we do another release, uh, if you can get in contact with me at Harland, cdrsoftware.com, let me know this actual number up here or the numbers that you would like to get, and I will make sure that those get installed on your system. Sometimes things need to be installed over a weekend. If it's something that's commonly used, like, for instance, work with orders or something like that that's in use pretty much all day long, we can schedule those things and we'll let you know uh, where you where things fall in the overall scheme. It, uh, it'll probably take us a time uh, to kind of work through all the requests and things that we get. And so just be patient with us. Um, so I want to talk about this whole block here of customer ranking. So, and you'll see there are different dates. So some of this stuff was done last year and then we've begun to refine a little bit. So let's just jump in here because it's something brand new. And we'll, sh you'll be showing you, we'll be showing you all kinds of different uh, areas of the system as we go along. So here we go. Let's look at customer ranking. So to get there, what I'm going to do is take option one for file maintenance, then option two for customer related maintenance, and then I'm going to go to work with customers. Everything stems from there. This is all about ranking your customers, so this is kind of a logical spot to begin. Over the years, people have asked, uh, what is this S for score? And that was something that was brought to us by a distributor um, that had attended a, um, a conference and, and there were ways to rank your customers based on uh, you know, how easy they were to, to service and so forth or how difficult. Um, and that was a supply with the whole Excel spreadsheet and things that were outside of CDR's purview and knowledge. So what we did is we used that as kind of a uh, an entry point for our take on things. So what you do to get to this ranking stuff is you do S for score beside a customer. So I'm going to do that. And it could be any customer at this point. That customer does need to be set up in here. So if you come in and it's blank, then just set one customer up and you'll be good to go. And we're just going to skip over this whole thing because this was out of a seminar uh, that uh, apparently people probably paid a service for. That is not what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about our own internal ranking mechanism. So what you want to do is after you get in here, press F18 for ranking. So I'm going to do that. And what you'll see, and there's a little confirm prompt, so I'll press enter again. And what you see are the topics that we've come up with so far. We've had a little bit of input uh, from, a, from another distributor 
we would welcome ideas of topics and things to put in here. Now, you can't just go and key in whatever you dream up because <laughs> on the back end, we have to write programs to go gather that information and digest it and put it in a usable form. But these are the this is the kind of nut and bolt uh, information that's in here at, at this point in time. So I want to kind of walk you through what each of these topics are and sort of the way we view they work. Now, you can change the values in here you can change the points and so every customer would be awarded points and sometimes they're positive points and sometimes they're negative points depending on what you want to do so all of this is fair game for each distributor to set up basically the rules for these topics what makes sense to them so let's just kind of walk through these uh, so you can understand what we have in here so first off the bat if so when you run this process, as, you, as I will show you, you're going to see a date range asked for, and also by default or, or in certain areas, it's going to use year-to-date figures right out of the core system. Why do we use year-to-date figures? Because those numbers, when they're accessible to us, are already boiled down and, and compressed. It saves the processing time of having to go across lots of transactional information uh, to pull things out on a date range. But we do have date range stuff in there because there are certain things in the system that are not boiled down into year to date type figures or month to date, but they are basically date range based. So we're using a combination of those to more efficiently process and do this ranking. I run this on a couple of customers of size. Uh, their ranking might take an hour and a half to run. So you basically kick it off and you wait and you come back uh, when that process finishes. So let's look at the topics. So average order dollars, level two. So you see, we have two topics here that have to do with average order dollars. So over a period of time, and this would be the period of time used in the date range. So this would be date range, not year to date. So you can put a date range in and it, it will go out and calculate uh, the, your average order for each customer. And so if their average order in just in my little example here is greater than or equal to, that's what that stands for, $1,000. So their average order greater than or equal to $1,000, then we're going to value them at 20 points. If they go a level higher than that, if they're average is greater than or equal to five thousand dollars well that's a 50 point customer like i say all these numbers are changeable by each distributor to set up their desired results so you can play with this it's not going to break anything you're not going to tear anything up i encourage you to get in and just experiment and see what makes sense for your company um so that is that first little category about average order dollars pretty straightforward then another notion that was presented to us as a suggestion is this whole area down here, which it really relates to what product mix is that convenience store buying from you. And so obviously you don't make as much money on, um, on cigarettes and tobacco in general. So how this is how you read that. So level one says, if there's cigarette and tobacco, and by cigarette and tobacco, we are just saying that would be categories one and two. Maybe three might be in there. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's one of those. But it's definitely category one, two. If category one and two, if 90% of what they buy from you in dollar value is cigarettes and tobacco, in my example, we're going to ding them. They're not buying enough other products from you. So you're, we're going to take some points away from their overall total for that. If they buy a little bit more, say only 80% of their product mix is cigarettes and tobacco, then we're only going to ding them for nine points and so forth. So these work in that fashion. It looks at each customer, looks at the product mix involved, and makes a determination. And so you'll see I have these as decrementing numbers here as far as how much we're going to punish them. If they're buying at least 50% of their product is non-cigarette and tobacco, you can give them a positive result. So you can play with these numbers, run the res run the test, run the results, and see what, uh, what really makes sense to you as a distributor. Another area down here, credit to order ratio. So 
the way you read this, greater than or equal to 5%, if, they, if their credits in dollar value are greater than or equal to 5% of what they're buying from you in sales, then we're going to say you're, you know, you're sort of exceeding uh, the, the credit limit. We, we feel like is a, a normal thing and we're going to, uh, we're going to punish you. <laughs> if you want to think of it that way, we're going to reduce your accumulated points by 20, 20 points here. Like say, set whatever values you want in here. These offsets out here, I'll get to those in just a moment. Generally, you won't touch those, but they're there for future expansion or other things too. So that's a credit to order ratio in percentage. Also, this little column here, here tells you actually what's being compared. Is it dollars? Is it a percentage? Is it maybe when you see the little hashtag or pound sign, that's actual just a number uh, that we're looking at. So let's look at deliveries per week because that's a number. So if I have to deliver this retailer, if they're set up on routing and we are delivering them more than one times a week, one time a week, uh, then we're going to say, well, you know, that's inconvenient to, or it's it's costly for us. I won't say inconvenient, but it's costly to the distributor to go make the extra stops during the week. And you can uh, assess whatever point uh, a value you want to put in for that. Uh, moving on down, insufficient checks. If they have greater than one over this period of time, this span of time, and this is a date-based thing based on the date range when you do your ranking process. If they have over one NSF check, then we're going to ding them for five points. You can make that two. You can make that. You can change your points. Do what you feel like makes sense as a company. I see my hourglass in my. I'm so fearful in this session that we're going to have a um, an internet breakdown. So hopefully we won't. I'll just say right now, if we do, we will either resume this, record it, do something. We will make a provision for it. So that's the only thing because we are working live without a net. All right, moving on. Net profit level. So I sort of went through this before, but the net profit level. So if they, if you make, and this is net cost dollars, that's why the word net is in there. So net profit, less than 2%, uh, one point. If it's, um, or, yeah, if it's greater than 2%, we're going to give you two points. If it's greater than 3.5, and this would be across all categories. So you sort of get the notion there of the net profit picture, that level. Past due level, this would be past due invoices. Um, so if you have one or greater past due invoices over the time period that's put in on the, the uh, ranking screen, when you actually go to get results, then we're going to uh, we're going to do something with points here. That should, probably should be a negative value. So let's just say it might be something like that. I'm gonna press page down and go to another page. So the past due levels, oh, you can see, well, actually that other one was okay. We're going to say, yeah, one, one point there, but uh, actually you have five different levels. So you can, the punishment can get greater if they're passing a lot of, or if they have a lot of past due invoices uh, during that time period. Uh, sales versus credit dollars with limited reasons. And I'm going to show you that when we actually show how the ranking process works. But basically sales dollars, total sales dollars versus credit dollars that you've issued over a time period. So this is date driven, but you can limit the reasons because obviously if it's a mispick or some type of problem that you've had is maybe damaged on delivery, whatever those reasons happen to be for you as a company, you can't really honestly ding the retailer for problems that are happening in house. And that's why we allow you to opt out up to 10 different reasons to not uh, basically reflect poorly on the credit to sales uh, comparison for a given retailer. Self-ordering, uh, basically if you don't send a salesperson that account, they're using it with a remote device, a, a web device, whatever, to place their orders. You can reward them for doing their own ordering uh, as opposed to you sending a salesperson out there and burning 
uh, time and valuable resources as a distributor. And just about to wind up here is terms day, so you can set the different terms codes. Uh, if you let them go longer on terms, you can, if you know, if they're paying cash, maybe this, you're you're going to give them a little better points because they are a cash customer and so forth. So you get the notion here: terms one to two days, terms equal to seven days, terms greater than seven days. And then the final one here topic is. Uh, are they using ACH? If they're using ACH and you feel like that uh, helps things for you, if you say using ACH, there's no number to put in here, uh, but if they're set up for ACH processing, and maybe that's worth five points to you as an overall score. So that's kind of the topics. I will once again reiterate, if you have other topics, things that you think are beneficial, drop me an email, let me know. We will start to build those other topics into the whole process so we can do those. If you have a topic that uh, doesn't qualify for you, just don't, don't fill out this area here. Leave it empty and it will just ignore this. So it, it must be, there must be points defined and there must be some type of comparison value before it, for it to actually do anything. So you can turn on and turn off the ones that make sense to you as a company. Now, I'm not going to run the ranking process, but I'm going to show you the results here. But I want to just show you what the ranking process screen would look like. So I'm going to press F24 from here. And this would actually go out and run that process to capture things. On my little test system, it takes about 10 minutes to run, but we're not going to burn 10 minutes on that. So I'm going to press F24, which is the shift F12. I'm going to say, yes, I do confirm. And it's going to bring you to and the simple the screen to, to run the stuff pretty darn simple you put that start and end date range and then for the credits you opt things their credit reasons up to 10 you just consecutively put them in a row here so if it if my credit reasons were one e d whatever you would put those in those would be the credits for reasons that are not used to um to, ref, to reflect poorly on the um, the retailer so that's how you would do that and you press enter and confirm kick that guy off and you can watch it work active job it runs under a job called cust rank um, or just come back uh, an hour or two later and look at your results and so to look at those results this is kind of the important part i'm going to press f3 to get there it says yeah you didn't do anything it's going to just cancel that because i didn't actually press enter and that's fine and I'll press enter here. I'm going to go back into my whole process here. Now I want to look at ranking results because typically you would get out of that and you would come back later. And that's why it kicked me uh, back out to the starting point. I'm going to press F18 this, from this screen for ranking results. And so what it does in um, on a screen, so you can just you know quickly refer to things, is you can come in here and you can search by topic. You can restrict to a given customer. Probably other restrictors will come up that people will will uh, think are good. But if I say, show me anything that contains the word past, so I can get all my past due levels. If you want to say just past due level, you know, a particular one, you can put the whole string of text in there and it will reduce it. Uh, you can put the customer number at the top. You can have four search for the customer. So you can look at it on screen. Hoop you do. Uh, the screen will show you some things, some immediate feedback, but really you want to do something a little deeper than that. So what you can do is if you press F6, it will do a printout. Now that printout when I ran it was, uh, could be in the range of 200 pages. So probably you would want to make sure that your printouts automatically go spool out and don't go automatically to a printer. If that's not the case for you, uh, we can set that print job to just go on hold so you don't burn the paper because it does at the same time produce a, a CSV file. I'm going to show you that. But this little reminder up here, pr print version will use a customer. So if you just want to run the print for one customer, you put a customer number in there and then you can see just the results for that one account. Otherwise, if you run it, it runs the results for all customers that it ran for. Um, so let's show you what the um, what the spreadsheet looks like. So I'm going to drag that over here into view. 
and we'll just tidy this guy up a little bit. And it is just a straight CSV file, so I'm sure that everybody on this call is more familiar with CSV than I am or Excel. But one thing I like to do is just sort of tidy it up a little bit is set my top row so it's a little more readable. I like to let's see, go over and freeze the top row. So now I can scroll through and see things. I need to expand this column here so we can see it. The, so it'll tell you the dates that are in there, but essentially it'll run for each customer. And then there's, it will, we've built in a little subtotal in here. So you can see the total amount of points for each account. So that's pretty much it at this point in time, but we, we we're anxious to get feedback from people to, to make it more effective and to do better things with it. I know there are a lot of third party tools that people use out there and people have rolled their own uh, solutions for this type of stuff. And that's fine. Uh, we're just trying to provide something for everyone else that maybe doesn't have those types of modules from third parties or, or don't have expertise in in house to do those things. So we want to grow this and build it out. So that is basically customer ranking as an introductory process. So let me get out of here and go back to the menu. And I want to come back over here and let's look. So that was this whole block up here. It's uh, 1024, keeping tra track of the time. We want to make sure that we have time to go through everything, but not too much time. Uh, this one will be pretty quick. Display customers for AR, new widescreen version. So let me pop that up. I'm going to go to accounts receivable. So what we're starting to do is um, provide more widescreen because you can put more content on the screen uh, to, to do certain things. So that's what this option here, display customers for AR, is about and a couple of things that, of interest. One other thing that we're beginning to to roll out uh, in a phased process is use of an F2 key when it's available on one of these wide screens to show more information. So by default, you come in, you view it basically the way you viewed it before. Although since we have a wider screen, now we can show uh, the last pay date, the total amount due for the account right here on this screen. So it makes it a little handier to kind of float down through this screen and see things. And then if you press F2, each, each customer becomes a two line entry. And so you can see a little bit more information in here, uh, you know, this, where they're located. Uh, let's see, the, uh, the corporate number, telephone number, the last time they placed an order. So, and we have a little more room in here, so we, we're looking for uh, input on effective ways to use this. I believe we, we may actually have, I don't see any in there, but uh, on one of these screens, I had actually put some a message on there, but I don't think it was AR when we were working through that. So your input, highly appreciated for what's in there. The F2 just flips you back and forth. It's just a toggle for more information. So we thought it would be beneficial, maybe save a few keystrokes for people to be able to do that. So that's why that piece of the puzzle got added in. Let's see what else we've got over here. Work with pre-books, there's a, a wide screen for that. So let's just jump there. And we are jumping around some, which is why we didn't publish a um, an agenda on the front end because we just didn't know really a, Good way to organize some of this stuff. Um, so pre-books, let's look at that. So I like to get there by going this way. There's multiple ways to get there, but take 42, take option 19, take option one. Also on all these widescreens, since they've been around for a while, um, I believe everybody understands that to, there are two things you have to do to be able to view a widescreen and the system senses if that's possible. Thing one, your session, your ACS session must be configured for a widescreen format and the, your user must be identified as a DAC user and you must have the widescreen 
set to Y in there for that. I think everybody understands that because we've been doing widescreens for three or four years now, or maybe maybe even five. But anyway, this is a different view, has a little bit more information, and we, what we put on here is the actual sales rep that services that account. That was a request from a customer. And if there are messages, let's just see if I press my um, F7 key to view some other stuff. If, if there are messages tied, okay, here are some. So for instance, if you plugged in messages to the pre-book order header, then those will show up here. My example here does, doesn't have a lot of them, but pro I think a lot of people use those messages religiously. And so that will just gives you another way to sort of view and uh, look at those things. So that's the widescreen version of work with pre-book orders. Press F3 and go back to the menu. Added sales group to the work with customers widescreen. So let's look at that widescreen. So navigating through, let's go back over here. Let's look at customers. And that's basically somebody wanted to see sales groups as a, as a restrictor because when we went to widescreen here, we have more room to do things. And so sales group is up there. Press F4 and search by group. I don't have any setup in this particular system. Oops. Um, the other things on this widescreen, if you're not familiar with it, um, now we actually show the belly matrix, the sales rep, the tax jurisdiction, uh, their primary delivery route is shown on here. The state, because sometimes that was a fit, um, helpful for people, the sales group. So more information on there. And also this has an F2 button now. And so, so once again, straight view, F2, more stuff per customer. So you can tell the last time they placed an order, the last time they paid, their phone number pops up, their sales year to date. So an, a notion there. Uh, their invoices year to date, 21, invoice dollars year to date. So more information with that F2 key. And that may be a subsequent uh, listing in our stuff, but I just wanted to show you the, those things while we're there. So widescreens, definitely trying to, to leverage that to, for better use. And the F2 key to expose more information is a technique that we want to adopt, especially if people say, hey, we really like that. We, we believe from our preliminary uh, uh, exposure to a couple of distributors that, the, that, that you will find that useful. All right, so back to a menu and let's see what else we've got here. Yes, so I covered those two. And so let's talk about to uh, work with items widescreen. So let's pop back into the system, view that. So let's go over to work with items. So widescreen view of this, I believe this has been, uh, definitely this is in use out there for multiple distributors. Not everybody, I don't, it didn't make the cut for the last release, uh, but we have installed it for some folks. So different ways to restrict the stop. And then the other information here, just to expand things out now, the retail pack shows up on here, category sales class, product class, tax class, the primary vendor for that, which typically we suggest is the manufacturing vendor, the brand code, the primary pick location, if it's a sign, shows up right here. The quantity available, which would be quantity on hand, less allocated, things that are in the process of being picked, shows up right here on the front screen so you can see it handily. The date you last sold the item, and if it's, I think, greater than 90 days, it shows up in red just to let you know, hey, this item's not moving. Maybe we should do something. Then uh, other little flags here. The, uh, is it an authorized item only? Is it a guaranteed item? Is it a pre-book only item? That's what those little columns there for. And then the status, is it an active item? One of these other PTF listings on our um, handout and spreadsheet is this, uh, where are we set here? 
let me just press F1. There were more function keys than would fit on the old narrow screen, probably on this one too. Uh, toggle between, the one I wanted to show is the F20. Toggle between on hand and on order. So I got there by pressing that F1 key. So I'm just press F3 and put that away. Then I'm going to press F20, which is a shift F8. And now it's changed this column here. And this is the next expected quantity and, and received date. So that's what, so that just flips this. I'll press F20 again. You can see what happens in that area. So on hand, sold date versus expected quantity and expected received date or last received date, whatever, depending on whatever it finds out there when it uh, inquires from the, the database to find out what we have in there. So that's work with items. So don't forget the F2. So F2 pops up and shows UPC codes, one, two, three, if, and if anything that's empty, we hide just to reduce some clutter. You can see the manufacturing part number pop out here. So once again, F2, just a handy way. Sometimes if you're looking for certain things and, you're, and you don't want to drill all the way in, or <laughs> who would want to do the extra keystrokes if you can avoid it? So that's the thought process here. And it looks like we have a little more space out here. So suggestions on things that would be effective from somebody that uses the system all the time would be very nicely received by us. Then we know how to make this a little more effective for us. So I'm going to press F2 and go back to the traditional view. You know, when you drill in, everything is normal. I'll do a um, get back to my edit. This might be a screen that would be a candidate at some point point for widescreen, but we, we're trying to just step through things in a logical process, um, but just kind of wanted to show you that. So that's that. Let's come back over here. So let's work with items widescreen. Uh, F2 now reveals a second line of information. We looked at that. So basically just some things for your information that will that are in the, uh, the handout. What we'll do is after this, we will send you a link for the YouTube channel playlist, it may take us several days or a week to sort of edit things out, get them published, get it tidied up. And we will also send out the uh, everything that we're presenting, the list. And um, in a, it probably won't be PowerPoint because we actually have it in a, uh, a Word doc type of thing that's a little more. So you don't have to have PowerPoint to view it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to press my space bar, go to the next section of things. So work with orders wide. So let's hop back to a screen. So we're going to show some order stuff now. So let's go there. So go over to work with orders. We started off with the current order file. We haven't done the history yet, but that would be a logical progression to uh, go through. So what we have here, so work with orders expanded out with a little more information on here now. So you can see the status, the source of order, the things that were already there before, the route, the number of line, the number of line items, sometimes handy to see if, you know, if it's a big order, small order, how many line items are in that? How many cigarette cartons are in it? What's the total of the dollar value of this order? And that would be including sales tax or tax information. So just the total order value, the order number. So we think that having those extra pieces will be helpful for people. Um, you have F2 on this screen. Let's see what that pulls up. So F2, before, whenever you would need to know when an order was created, you could get there. You could zoom into the header. And then you can press F24 to see the creation date, pick date, things of that nature. Uh, the F2 screen brings that information out to the front. So this order was created on the 14th of October at 8.09. All this blank information in here, uh, in, in uh, hopes of keeping things tidied up in here, if, if we don't have information, we don't show it. So, But this would also show the pick date and time. It would show the invoice date and time. So those are other pieces of information in here, not really uh, uh, 
on my example system that we're displaying from, but that's why it shows up in here. So we think that adding the order creation date and the creation date means they just created the order online or when the order splashes into the current order file from remote from your from a web portal or from a remote field device all those things are what we consider the creation date and times when it splashes down um, so we think those will be helpful also we show the salesman id right here on on the main screen now when you press f2 and the stop for that particular route so you can see this is on route 300 stop two and this blank space out here to the right is probably a good candidate for some more information. Um, thinking that possibly, let's just try something. Okay. Yeah, if you have a message, it shows up out here. And so, and they go, if message one is populated, that shows up. If message one is empty, but special message two is populated, that shows up. If special message one and two are empty, but three is populated, that shows up out here. So that's what we're doing with that space. Uh, we think that's the correct batting order for those messages. If you have other notions on that, uh, let us know, but that's that's where we started. So you can see messages out here. So just to kind of show you how that piece works. Um, let's see, there's something else on here. So that's basically work with current orders. Um, now let's look at the, the order totals. Um, and that would be the order totals from within the order. So let's see here if I can. I think maybe cranky corner order they might have totals and if they don't i will show you where those show up i'm just going to do a five to display i'm going to press f16 to show the total screen yeah this one doesn't but if there are rebates involved a line appears here and, and this would these would be off invoice rebates broken out so not rebates that you're accumulating for a future credit or check or, or whatever mechanism you use to produce those but it would appear right here for you so that's what that uh, particular patch does i guess everybody knows just while i'm looking at this the f5 if you press that gives you a categorical breakdown sometimes if you're taking a phone in order or something of that nature you need to know categorically maybe the customer has a finite budget for today's order and they want to see what they have and maybe they want to do a little back and forth to try to stay in their budget. That's F5 has been there for since the previous release. So you all, everybody has that. Just wanted to kind of point that out. Now, order merging was another thing. I'll just draw this thing down here. So select orders for merging is now a widescreen. If you're enabled for widescreen with your session and your user ID. So let's look at that. And F6 to for the merge order screen. So a little more room on here to space it out. Uh, the I naturally follows across single lines opposed to multiple lines. Uh, F2 down here is a toggle for selected only. So F2 is doesn't it? It's not an expander like on the other wide screens. I don't, really don't know what we would expand in here, but you can. Um, but a different view of this uh, shows order totals, total lines. And I think those were not available before. The route it falls on, and more specifically, this particular patch here, um, a warning if if you select one order to merge with another, if those two orders have different routes, it's going to say, hey, you know that you're merging two orders that are set to go on different routes. Sometimes you want to do that, sometimes not. At least you know. Whereas in the past, you didn't know until uh, until the orders merged and things went to route out. So that's what that patch involves. I'm going to press F3. Now, if you have more than a one-to-one -one order, merging one order to another order, they're on different routes. It will warn you, let you know. But if you're merging multiple orders all at the same time, they're on different routes. It's it's 
it's too complicated to try to tell you what all those differences are in there. So just know that that's a one-to-one -one relationship. But I think for most people, if you're doing auto merging, things of that nature, automatically putting things together, you probably don't go there. The merge, the manual merge screen is more of a, um, you know, a different circumstance type of thing, not a day in, day out type of uh, process, I think, for most people. So let's see, Slater so did that one. Work with item allowances. There is a widescreen version of that. So let's look at that guy. So I'm here in billing. Let's hop to option 20. If you get the notion, what we're trying to do is make the things that we have more accessible, less keystrokes, more, and make the user interface better for you. That's kind of an overarching focus from the past year of development and one that we're going to continue, especially as people let us know um, where it would be the most helpful. And if it helps if I press the proper key here, so let's do that. So a widescreen version of this guy's just bring some things out to the front that were maybe embedded inside before. No F2 to expand, but that would be a possibility. Um, Maybe we had the F2 to expand just the notions that come to me off the top of my head. Is if it's a, um, if it's a um, detail controls price type of thing, might be really handy out here to see how many lines are involved in that parent item. Because uh, here we're basically looking at the parents. But if we did an F2 in here or some other function key that's available to maybe expand out before you have to drill all the way in to, to see more effective things, uh, would might be a, a relatively simple addition to this, but make life simpler for you, which is what we're trying to do here. Uh, but yeah, you can see it's a sense of allowance. So what the, the master allowance is, if it's restricted to a given vendor, does it affect inventory? Uh, do we want the individual components to be counted you know, separately, like for the uh, invoice and pick list? That's work with allowances the widescreen version. Let's see what else we've got over here. Okay, so we've gone through that page, so I'm gonna press, move it on ahead. Global price change. So let's look. We've had requests for multiple years to be able to import pricing from a spreadsheet. That's basically where, this is the starting point for that. So I'm going to show you how those pieces work. And I just stuck for the handout and things of that nature, just a little screenshot of some, but I'm going to walk you through the different pieces that are involved here in importing a global price change. And this also involves a new widescreen version uh, that we hope is a little more readable. So let's look at that guy. So I'm going to jump back to the main menu. I'm going to go products, I'm going to go to enter update global price changes. So widescreen version of this, the narrow, the traditional screen before I think had uh, three or four lines per item in there. Um, if you're accustomed to looking at that, it's probably okay. When it's a brand new uh, customer for CDR or a brand new higher at your company that uses this sometimes it takes them a little getting used to so we tried we made an attempt to simplify what can sometimes be a complicated process so if it's an item level price change we show the word item if it's product class we show something like p class if it's uh, you yeah, know we put text on here so you can see the multiple scopes involved but on a single line and if it's an item, we show you the item number. If it's product class, sales class, category, then we show the equivalent to that here to just reduce some screen real estate. The description of what it is, here it's an item. If it were a product class, we would see the product class just, uh, description and so forth. Uh, the date, and that would be the effective date. I've got some things just sort of hanging out here. The warehouse that's involved. And then you'll see uh, some values across here. And we tried to organize them, manufacturer list, net, 
base price retail into columns to make, hopefully make it a little more readable. And we start this screen with the F2 expanding. If you want to collapse this down and you're just looking for things and you're not really looking so much for the values, but you want to see what's pending by press F2, it collapses it. So I would see a long list here of things. Maybe if I'm just paging down or up through the things and I'm trying to get to some place, uh, the F2 might get you there with less paging and then you can expand out by pressing F2 again to show the values inside there. So that's basically the new look at that. This is installed on a customer system. And I think they were going to try to do some price changes with it a week or two ago. So, and I had, I didn't hear anything negative back. So that tells me that probably it was okay. Usually if something doesn't work properly or could be better, I know, I hear about that. Um, these little codes out here, it's an implied change. It is an overlay, meaning it's going to replace. We're going to notify the price change and we're going to hold the price if it's available. Now, holding and notifying, as you know better than I do, only do something if you have them defined anyway. So those are probably should be default values most of the time, and you can just change those. Let's show you how you would import from a CSV file. So you get to this screen and you press F15, which is a shift F3. And that's gonna bring up the little screen example that's in there. So a couple of things to note, and there's, a, there's some verbiage, which is one reason that we put that actually in the PowerPoint and the handout, just so you could sort of know how things are structured to operate at this point. So you restrict to a warehouse, that's a required field. You must give it an effective date. See, those are required fields. So if I give it an effective date um, and I say, all right, do not commingle adjustments with overlays in a single batch to pull in because that made it a lot more complicated and we felt like it was much more too complicated um, for the first go around for people to become accustomed to this. if they were saying I'm raising the price by 50 cents on these and I'm actually replacing the price on those and that means that those have to be indicated inside of the spreadsheet itself so we can react accordingly or done in some way some fashion like that so we decided to just keep it simple for this first go around and say you know, you do your batch and are they, what are they? Are you adjusting pr prices and costs? Or are you replacing them? So that's what that does. Uh, you can, def the defaults for price hold and notify are in here. So by default, it's gonna always say those. And by default, it's gonna say, it's gonna know if it's implied or adjusted because it's gonna know based off of uh, this information up here. There's no provision for formulated. I, I can't think of the last time I talked to a customer that was using formulated changes. All that still works. We haven't taken that away. It's just not part of the import process. And you give it a file name. So I don't think I made a note anywhere. But let's see if I can remember the file I put in. So I'm going to say today, my effective date is 10 2021. And it's assuming that the file is in the QDLS CSV files folder. That's where it's going to look. So when you do this, that's where you'll want to put your stuff. And I think I have a little test. That doesn't look right. Pardon me. I, if this doesn't work, I will have to go look it up for what I actually have in my system. I think it was called priceimport.csv. I just abbreviated it. It's laid out in this fashion. So it's, yeah, let's talk about that for a moment before we do something. So you have, these are the columns in the spreadsheet. Item number, UPC code, manufacturer list, net base, list price, MSRP, the retail. So if you define, if you have an item number and it can find that item number, that's what it's going to use. If you don't know the item number, maybe it's something you get from a supplier and they don't know your item numbers, they can tell you UPC codes. 
it will take the UPC and resolve that back to your item number. Uh, so in that circumstance, if you have a UPC code, it's probably best to just leave the item, unless you want to supersede it, the item number always trumps UPC code. And then it will use these values over here. Now, manufacturer list, if it comes in, but net base list price and MSRP are empty, and you have a, there's a system option that you could, that people have set up, system option 006 tells it whether in overlay mode, whether to use percentages that you have at the item level to ripple, you know, to calculate the results based off of manufacturer list, it will do that. You'll see the results. So you're going to see what's going to happen before anything changes. And just to show you, um, yeah, I don't really have a, uh, I don't have an example of the spreadsheet, but it's very simple. It's column A is item, column B, UPC, and so forth across the page. Let's just try this and see if I remember the right file name from last week. So I'm going to press F10 to run the import process. I'm going to say yes, I confirm. So here's what it pulled in. So we had the keyboard items before. And this is an item by item by item type of import because we believe, rightly or wrongly, that when you're importing this stuff from a supplier or some other source, they're not going to know anything about your classifications or none of that will make sense to them. And so that's why we've started at item level. If you have a if your world experience is different, then let us know and we will, you know, we can revise things. This is the first blush on it. But here I have uh, Pell-Mell cigarette coming in. Uh, in my file, I had uh, this value and I, this one was set up as a UPC. So it resolved in this circumstance, I had a case level UPC that it looked up, found the item number, resolved that back. And of course, we're doing everything here at standard cell level. So it took my manufacturer list, and it calculated the other results. And I know these values have nothing to do with the real world. This is test data. And similarly, uh, these are set up that way. So a camel filter was in a similar way uh, using manufacturer list only, um, but with the item number instead of UPC defined. And then this one here, we're actually just adjusting those values all together and saying this is what they are going to be now. Don't, if they're if those values are present, it doesn't calculate, it just uses them, especially well in the overlay mode, they become replacements. So you've got this stuff in here. If you run it, if the results don't look correct to you, you can always delete the rows out of here. You could re-import, you can change things. So this is basically your chance to verify what's going to happen uh, before you before the effective date comes around. Of course, you can run it, uh, you know, manually from the option ten on the menu too. If it's like in cigarette price change, you're not going to wait probably for end of day. You're going to put the stuff in. You're going to run it. This is probably not a, the import's probably not a good candidate for cigarette price changes. It might be. I, I don't know. Uh, you would know better than I on that. Um, but that's. That's basically the way that works, and I think we've spent some time on that. So that's the global price change import. New widescreen, different format, and um, just once again to, to look at. So suggestions people might have, we would welcome. I think we have a little bit of, bit of room over here to add something that's useful. If you have a suggestion, drop me an email. We'll put it in our mixer and prioritize things and put it on the to-do list. All right, so I'm gonna press and go ahead. Now we start looking at some other areas. So let's, um, so route search from order header now visually indicates the primary route. So let's do that. I'm going to go into an order and I'm just going to do, you can do this a couple of ways. I'm going to use a five uh, just because it's 
there are multiple ways to get there. A five to view, F10, when you get to the route field, that's the part I'm thinking about here. F4 to search. And so if you have multiple routes for that customer, the primary route's indicating that little red P. Not a gigantic thing, but if you have multiple routes for that customer and you want to know which one's the primary one, you don't have to think about it too much because it's going to tell you that's what that whole patch was about. And that's available uh, from a lot of different views. It's, you know, when, as you're creating the order, things of that nature, usually after the fact, it's for people that are, that are have a lot of flex and fluid uh, environment for their routing, that will be handy for them. A lot of people are set up, they have their routes set and those things fall in place and they don't think about those things. So there are different size of distributors and different environments we're trying to support. That's what that function does. All right, something totally new. New to everybody. So let's look at that. Option 11 on the customer special pricing menu. There's a new option on there. And it's basically what we're doing is we're rendering the finished price, the custom retail for every customer, every item that you have set up. Why did we do that? For a long time, people, if they wanted to do a query or something of that nature in-house, that's kind of a, that's always a computed value. So we wanted to have a place to store it. And more importantly, this is a stepping stone in our, pro, our modernization process because by producing it this way, we can serve up an API to a third party to use in our own applications where the API can, que can query this and it can return a finished price the last time it changed, a, a custom retail and so forth. So it, it lends us to build out and interface to other things. And you'll see Shopify mentioned in here uh, in my collection. But I'm, so that's kind of why we're tackling this. There, I put the file name in here. And when you get this, oops, let me go back. <laughs> this is the file name. If you wanted to build a query over this and then maybe join the customer uh, master file and the item master file into your query and be able to produce something that showed their actual price and when that price was last calculated, it makes it much simpler to do in a query now. Uh, you can export that file to a CSV and I'm going to kind of show you through that. So let's jump over into the system. Let's go back to the main menu. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take option six for the reports menu. Then I'm going to take option one for customer reports. Then I'm going to take option 20 for special customer reports. And this is our new kit on the block down here, number 11. By the way, this, as I look at this, this is, is a good candidate for a widescreen, but uh, we started off just a traditional screen value. So what does this tell me? If I, um, if I want to just look at Big John's Quick Stop, this is every item for Big John's Quick Stop, number one. So you see there's a lot of stuff. So you can restrict by customer and item. Might behoove us because underneath the covers, this file also has inside of it category, sales class, product class, some other uh, product related scopes of uh, what's covered. So we could probably add more restrictors at the top, but we started off simply because this is actually a process that we're serving up API for a couple of uh, uh, a couple of projects that are working right now. So this is a, a work in progress. This piece has been done for a while, but we can build out. This is the back end service for that. So basically it's saying, hey, their current price is $48.98. The last time I ran, their price was still $48.98. So when those are the same, we know that price change hasn't happened yet. It was last determined yesterday's date. So one way to run this is to put a scheduled process in that runs probably overnight, takes it maybe an hour and a half to run. It computes all the prices. And then you can see things where the price is actually changed in here. So your query could do that same thing. If you're doing a query, say 
Show me only things where current price and previous price are not the same. Then you know there's been a price change or a retail change. So there's a lot of things you can do just with a query alone outside of the whole uh, realm of APIs. Application Program Interface is what API stands for. It's the way that computer systems can talk to each other. It's the way that modern systems talk to third parties, to web, web interfaces, things of that nature. Um, so part of our modernization uh, projects that are going on. But so you can see the stuff in here. And if there's an allowance, we break that out. We show the, the basically the standard unit of measure that's involved here. Now, the schedule process can run for all customers. If you don't need to have it run for all customers, you can save some time. And you can budget that stuff out by enrolling the customers that you want. So let's just take a peek at that. Quickly here. So if I press F7, and you'll see I'm calling my description Shopify customers. You can change that to be whatever description you want. There is a specific customer collection that we use as a reserved number that tells us this relationship in here. But you can give it the description that you want. Um, I think by default, it's, at this point, probably calls it Shopify, but you could call it something else. And then you can assemble the customers in the, the collection that you want. If you want to just do it for certain customers, that's what my example here is. But we can run that process for all customers. Just know that we need a window overnight, probably, uh, maybe a couple hours to run, depending on the size of your, uh, your business that's involved. It can run while other processes are running. So it doesn't have to run dedicated by itself in the middle of the night, probably be a good idea to do that. Um, probably wouldn't want it running during end of day, for instance, but I, I, if you're, depending on how you save and back up your data, it would probably run right through that just fine, even in that circumstance. So just kind of giving you some basic information, but you can enroll the customers just like you do with any other customer collection. This is a special collection where we know the relationship between this customer pricing process in that collection. Uh, if you need to just run it manually, you can kick that thing off from right here by pressing an F24 and it will go calculate right now. It'll run through the whole routine. It will price out every customer, every item involved and, um, and, and render a result. And what it does is it stores the previous price and if the new price is different, then of course it moves current price to previous. So when you when there's a difference here, you can tell. And in my example here, I don't have any differences, but we definitely have this in process or working on a couple of customer boxes. So if I press F15, it will just show me anything where there are differences. So you just show me the things that changed is what that does. And of course, I don't all my previous and current prices are identical, so I'm not seeing anything uh, in my little example here. So you can export the results of this file. Like I mentioned, I wanted to just kind of show people a couple of things here. HWAMCPP. In case you're not aware, and I think generally people are not aware because this is a sort of a tucked away feature that leverages some built-in functionality in your IBM system. But anytime, if you know the name of a file and you want to export that file, not it's not a, actually you can do a query and join multiple files together and then and, set, and have the query create that as a file. And then you could actually pull that file out with other stuff in there. But this is just a raw, nothing else type of version I wanted to kind of show you. HWAM's CPP. If you're people that do queries, they know these file names or can look them up. Let's show you how that would work. Just so people will know a couple of things you can do. I go over to the file maintenance menu. I take this option nine down for down here for miscellaneous file maintenance. Tucked away in a nice protected spot, sort of protected, not readily visible. If I take option four for system event log, which I am going to come back to this at the end if we have some time. But from here, this little guy down here, F24 export a database file. Let's just do that. 
So I'm going to press F24, which is a, pardon me, I'm trying to keep my throat moist with a peppermint. F24, I shift F12, database file. The file that I'm talking about here is HWAM CPP. It's in the library on this system in DAC Conf for you. Most of the time it'll be DAC data, unless it's a, um, a financials file. What folder do I want to put the results in? I'm going to put them in CSV export. It tells you how to structure it. You need the forward slash at the beginning, forward slash at the tail, so it builds up a nice little, basically a string of information that tells the system, here's where to put it. And then what you want to call it, and I'm going to say, um, you'll want to end it in the CSV just so it'll automatically open up in Excel. Now, this field here, I cannot say yes on my system because it will throw an error because the system I'm running from it, run, running on is running operating system version six and the ability then the IBM utility that we call to actually put column names in the first row only became available in version seven. Almost all of our customer set is running version seven, one, seven, two, seven, three, or higher. So for you, you could probably put a Y here. For my example, I cannot do that. So I'm going to just leave that blank because I'll just get raw data. And I'm going to say run. And it says, oh, by the way, just doing a little processing. Come on, hurry up. All right, so it's created that file for me. So the file's out there. So if you have a shared folder where you can get into the uh, into the system to look at stuff, you go look at CSV exports, you'll find your file. Uh, another way to get around that is if you don't know that, and I'll just show you this piece of the puzzle, which was also at the end of our handout as far as extra things you can do, just so for the sake of completeness. Uh, if I have shared folder access, I'm just going to open up my file explorer in Windows probably and go find that file and pull it in and, and go on my merry way. But if you maybe you're working from home, maybe you don't have VPN access to the entire network, you just have access to a green screen, whatever the circumstance might be. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but if you go to system options file maintenance and you take option 21, and your system, like almost everybody's system, is enabled for email straight out of that out of your IBM box. Then you could use this guy right here, email a folder document. Get my cursor down here where it needs to be. So I would give it my folder document. I think I named that thing demoopt.csv, and it was in the folder. CSV exports, I think it was, trailing slash, give the email a subject. And maybe some text in the body, a little short note to yourself, and then you press enter, and it's going to prompt for email addresses. And you will put the email addresses that you want to send it to, press enter, and it'll off to the race as you go. So we'll send that as an attachment. So you can use a combination, and I'm just going to bail out of this. Let me know I didn't follow through with it. But wanted to kind of explain, first of all, email a folder document a little bit. I think we might have covered that in a previous session. Probably everybody on this uh, call is not, maybe didn't attend that particular year's customer conference. Uh, so you have that. And then the other thing, if I just press the right function keys here, is uh, under display system event log, we were just kind of casting around for a spot to put this. And so when you go into that option in F24, export a database file. For the people that like to roll their own, if you will, and do their own thing and, and pull information out of the system, that's going to be a tool that 
may come in handy for you. So we just wanted to show that. And I guess while I'm in here, let's just talk about system event log. I see it's, uh, I have 11, 12 central time. So we have a little bit of time and just trying to, trying to use this as a way to convey some information. System event log, we track all kinds of things. There's all kinds of SIM stuff in here. These are EDI processes that run, but there's other stuff in here if you know how to, we know some of the functions in here. And we don't support F4 on that, but I happen to know that end day is something. So if you want to see when you're ending the day for each date, you know, when it ran, the time of day and so forth, all that stuff shows up. Now, I know we have this in the display message log, but here it's actually data. And guess what? You could export this to a spreadsheet if you needed to, if you're trying to look at some kind of trends or things of that nature. So end day is one of them. Um, there are several things out here also. You can search in here in this little area here in this contains box. If I want to find, let's see if there's anything for a particular Please. deck connect user that I use. So I can also see deck connect log. Yes, I can see other things. It's not just for that, it's for the things that we're plugging into the system event log, and we are steadily adding things to that. Um, Let's see, I think, let's look at user. There's some user related information. I, and I'll show you some of these uh, pre book specific things in the, uh, in a, that are over on the pre book menu itself at the end of the session, towards the end. Um, but there are things in here for like knowing, uh, let's say the system. Yes. Who changed the system option? Who went in there and pressed enter on things? Look, Harlan was changing system option, uh, the general system option sys15 record on the 18th at that time. So it, when you're trying to find things of that nature, so we are writing some system event, or pardon me, writing into the system event log things that people are changing in the system options file. So there's some multiple places we feed this from and you can see who did it when they did it and so forth that's an area we're going to continue to build on as well because i will tell you that probably i can't put a number to it but probably somewhere between five and ten percent of our support requests i feel like are people saying who i want to know who changed this when they changed it and what they did and so we get many audit type of requests from our customer base out there. So just kind of wanted to cover that quickly. So now I've gone off the rails. Let's jump back on track. Um, let's see, customer pricing. So we've talked about that. So that is going to be, we think, is a very useful segment of the system for everybody. Uh, PO to AP link, so sending purchase orders over to AP. There's a file called AP links that holds that stuff. And uh, so I'm going to jump over to work with, work, work with AP transfers. I'm going to use F6. And it's going to, all, every time I run it, output a file that's always named POAPLink.csv. It's going to stick in the CV1COM folder. I'm going to talk about folders for a minute, too. We stick a lot of things in CV1COM, as you probably noticed. We have a new folder called CSV files and a folder called CSV exports. We're trying to spread things out so that uh, the CV1COM folder that we had used traditionally for years doesn't become overwhelmed with information. And there is a finite limit of the number of files and the amount of disk space that can be uh, allocated for the QDLS subsystem, which is a it basically, it's, it's think of it like, I go in a room and that room has a bunch of file cabinets in it. And if QDLS is that room, there's you can only put so many file cabinets in that before it fills up. And also, if you have a folder in there, that would be a file cabinet. And that file cabinet has a finite limit. So there are finite limits to things. And we're trying to find ways uh, without upsetting the apple cart and, and um, changing people's existing workflow and how things interface to sort of build out and spread out where the files go. So that's a thought process. So 
let's go to AP links just peek at this guy real quick so I'm gonna go to purchasing I'm going to go to I think it was AP transfers if I remember correctly F6 print PO to AP links if you're interfacing to our accounts payable system from PO system, you will know about that. And you just run this guy in here and it's automatically going to produce that spreadsheet, which looks like, let's see if I have an example of that. I do not have an example uh, pre can for that, but that's, I think people that are doing it, this has been around for maybe a year or two. So that might be an area, if you don't know, our support team can get you up to speed on on what's in there, but I think if you go find the file, it'll be bleedingly apparent to you when you look at it. Moving along, work with vendor items. Let's look at that guy while we're over here in purchasing, because it got some things refreshed in it. So I'm gonna pick a vendor. And my information here is fairly abbreviated, but it'll illustrate the point. So if I do a five to do work with vendors items, and there's the widescreen version of it, which has been around for a while. We've added the F2 function in here to expand things. So even the widescreen, there's more stuff people need and want to be able to see without having to drill into things. So we're trying to flesh this part out. So by default, you come in, you see the traditional view. And then if you press F2, we expand. And now we're, we're showing up right here, manufacturing ID, the manufacturer part number, whatever you want to call it, whatever term, the manufacturer's ID number for that product. The last PO it was on, how many were on that last PO, the PO number of the most recent PO, when this item was actually created, because if it's a new item, sometimes you want to know that. Now, there is a little indicator out there if the item's been added in the past, I think it's 45 days, but actually being able to see the creation date may be a benefit. And then this little underlying area here, I believe if there is a message tied to it, let's just put that to the test here and see. So we'll do an M to tie a message to that. I'm going to add a new message. I'm going to say and I'm going to say it defaults to today's start date. I'm just going to make this go up to the end of the month. And I'm going to say this is a purchasing type of message. And I think that's all I need to do there. We're about to find out. So I press F3 and go back. So I've got that added in. And so, so now your messages will be visible here when you press F2. So, and if you have more than one message, different reminders and so forth, and you do that M beside the item, it pop, but it's gonna show the first message it finds. So you know there's some, some more information in there. So people indicated to us that that would be useful for them to make little notes, not have yellow post-its stuck around on their monitor or things of that nature. Uh, let's see if there's something else in here. So work with vendor items, last PO number, so showed you that on line two. So F2 added to that screen now as well. I think there's another purchasing related thing in here. Just move ahead while we're here. Uh, F24 shows received items. I'm just gonna go back. We'll just cover that one while we're here. So yeah, F24, oh, that, that's on uh, work with purchase orders. I'll show you that in a minute when we get actually get to that point. That's pretty much it inside of here. So with some additional stuff, that F, don't forget F2 is your friend. More information without having to zoom or drill into something else. Got a little message out there. I'm keeping an eye on the times now, 11.22 Central Time. 
We appreciate everybody sticking with us through this. If you had to drop off, we are recording it, so don't feel bad about that. Customer address labels are selectable by sales range, salesman range. That's a new change. I'll just show you that real quick. Not a lot to see there. And I'm just going to do a shortcut here for the brevity of time. So I'm going to go straight to the labels menu. Customer address labels, option three. And then now you can run a customer address labels for a salesman range, maybe just Joe or Jane or whoever the salesperson is, uh, put them as the start and end, do address labels just for them. So just another way to kind of go about that when you need to print uh, mailing labels for whatever your purposes are. I'm sure you guys are familiar with all the different options that have been in here, longstanding. Uh, we do, from time to time, add features into the address labels. People use those in different ways, and maybe not just always snail mail. Um, so that's what that function is. All right, moving ahead. Uh, commission report prompt. There was, and this is just informational, I won't show it, but when you run a commission report, it actually tells you, because it will pr produce a CSV file. I think it's been doing that for a while, but what this revision is, is it tells you on screen where that, what that file is going to be named and where it's going to put it. So that's on screen only. We won't take up time showing that, but that's where that is. Uh, also on the cust customer address listing, there is a listing screen that you can do customer address listings. That's from 614. Oh, also these numbers are menu navigation. I think most people familiar with the system see that and immediately know what that means, but I'm gonna do a 614. So let's do that, 614. Or, and just somebody said, hey, guess what? We're, sometimes we want them if they're inactive. Other times we don't. So you can just restrict by status on here. And there's the uh, build a customer CSV list. So you have that available in here. Moving along. Um, this is nothing really to show, but information. So uh, when you close the your year in GL. Uh, previously, it, it uh, backed it up to tape, and now that's no longer needed. That's just letting basically information like, you know, tape backups no longer needed because that data is copied uh, to this particular spot. So, as information, wanted to put that on here just so people would know when you have that patch, which was added since the last cut, so or the last release that we do, we call them cuts internally uh, because it's a cutoff to us of all these uh, projects, numbers that we do. Anything, as I mentioned at the beginning, that you see in here that you would like to go ahead and get before we do another release, if you drop me an email, harlan at cdrsoftware.com, let me know the numbers that you want and I will make sure that gets scheduled and we get those pieces installed. Sometimes a particular patch drags along other things that are related to it and they have to go as a, uh, as a contiguous set so sometimes it takes us a little bit of time to put the pieces together. Sometimes, sometimes we have to do it on a weekend or when we have full access to your system. So that's just you know a little inside baseball about how those processes work for us. Uh, the GL detail report now builds a CSV file. Uh, an example attachment is done, and I have one sort of pieced together here. So let's move that guy over to our viewing space, and there's, basically it's just taking the stuff that was on the printed report, puts it in a CSV so you can open it up in Excel and play some fun with it. And this, the account number here, let's see, that's a long string and it's showing it in scientific notation. I can fix that by saying, yeah, let's format those cells and let's just say they are, uh, General is the one that I forget which option it is. You probably do this more. I did this yesterday. I call them custom. Now, there's a way to do that where you actually see the account numbers, not scientific notation because it's can Excel things. Oh, that's a long number. I don't know what to do with that. 
that's why that shows up. But anyway, this is an example of what that would look like. Drag that back off to the other screen. So that's that option. AR detail report creates a CSV file. Are you starting to sense a pattern here? And so let's look at that. So the AR detail report, let's see if I can. Come on. I can remember where that is. I'm going to bid. AR detail report, that's the guy right there on the AR reports to menu. So it's going to kick that file out when you run this. And that file is going to look like this. If you need to give it to your bank or whatever, I always like to tidy up my column headings. I like to freeze those. Freeze panes, top row, so I can scroll and still see what the column headings are. H, it's in history, see it's still current. Basically, customer number, corporate customer, customer name, the date, the type of transaction, payment, invoice, adjustment, et cetera. The invoice number that was involved, the original amount, what's remaining. And so you have that. So that's what that option is. So we've exhausted that PowerPoint screen. All right, VR deal header. I'm not gonna show this one, but just know that whenever you set up, when you're creating a brand new VR deal or you go to edit one and change the dates before, it would allow you to put an end date that was less than the start date. That doesn't work too well. And it's a rare circumstance, but we did have somebody do that. And after much head scratching, we finally realized what was going on, that the dates were flip-flop. And so what it does now, it just says, hey, guess what? You put your end date before the start date. Fix that before we move along. So that's what that option does. Not a big deal, but it's a big deal if you make that mistake. Trust me, um, because things aren't tracking right and th things just don't work right. And so then you have to go back and um, re, uh, rejigger the, the information that gets computed from there. So that's a stitch in time saves nine type of fix. Um, added a confirm, confirm prompt to work with vendor items for load to PO. So on that vendor, I, I knew there was another thing for vendor items, and I'm not going to navigate back over there because our time is starting to slip away. But before and work with vendor items, you know, you could get in there at people that know that screen and you could sort of work up your, your PO and you can press F12 to create the PO. Well, if you hit F12 by mistake, it just went ahead and built the PO for you. And then maybe you didn't want that to do that. So all it does now is it pops up a little thing and says, are you sure you want to really do this? And you answer yes to it to proceed. So that was a suggestion from a couple of customers because they had gone through that. It wasn't a giant inconvenience, but better to ask, are you sure? So that's what that patch is for. Edit customer routes. Primary delivery route can now be changed. You can, I just want to show you this because I don't think that a lot of people probably understand what is possible here, that you can go in and actually view the routes and edit things and do stuff with the routes without going into the full-blown customer file. Sometimes if people are doing that and they don't have the should not have the authority to go in and be editing a, the whole customer, but maybe transportation department, and they're concerned about routing and things of that nature, but they could give a hoot if, you know, how that customer is categorized or the billing matrix they fall in. So that's why this came about. So let's look at that. So if I go to the main file maintenance, I take option one for customer related, I go to not work with customers, which would be the normal spot, but I'm going to go to the route master definitions. And maybe I put a route in here and let's see, what kind of a route do I have that might have something in my test data that's set up? Let's look at route 500, see if I have anything in there for that. 
and our, our data on this is a little squirrely. So it builds some information. And so now I can look at Route 500 in stop sequence. And here, I, I luckily picked one where Route 500 is a Friday route, which for most people, if, I mean, if 500 doesn't have to be a Friday route, but I actually don't have things commingled in that are other days of the week and so forth. So this is a pretty clean uh, example of what would happen. So now you can see them in stop sequence, the way you have them in here, um, where they are. So, so this guy, and actually, you know, those are all independent or in, individual stores and where they are. And then if I do it too with the patches or the reference that we're looking at, the reference number is what happens when you edit. So if I go to edit this, I can edit the call routes, salesman call routes and the delivery routes straight from here. I don't have to go all the way into the customer master file to do those things, um, which is a division of labor. So transportation needs to be able to do what transportation needs to do. And I can edit these things directly from here, change them to a different route. I can now change the primary route and that's going to get updated. So I can do the things I could do before by drilling into the customer, hitting page down twice, going to the third screen, uh, dealing from there. So just a little nicer way to set up and maintain routing uh, for the transportation department. And uh, there's a couple other restrictors up here at the top, but you get the idea. Um, you may, people may say, what the heck is a transportation route? We do have a, um, a feature in DAC, deli del pardon me, DAC delivery manager, which is not being presented today because that's an optional module that allows you to actually if you're if you're putting things together onto a transportation route, and basically that transportation route then goes to another distri distribution center, and then it offloads its things, and then those individual there, it contains multiple actual delivery routes that get sent from that remote distribution center on their respective delivery routes. That's what a transportation route is in this scenario, and it's only supported by DAC Delivery Manager if you want to do that. So that's just keeping track of everything you load onto the semi, the tractor trailer rig to send to another DC, unload that, and then actually do your deliveries on routes from there. So this way to kind of assemble things into a transportation route scenario. Um, okay, and this one we talked about well, we didn't talk about it. if you're still running the narrow screen version or the traditional screen version of work with orders, the current order file, there were so many function keys at the bottom, we didn't have re real estate to list those. And so the, on that older uh, traditional screen, they added an F1 key to just pop up, show you what all your possible function keys are, your command keys. Uh, we didn't do that on the widescreen because we had a real estate to list all those function keys across the bottom of the screen. So that's why this was necessary on the traditional view of things. Work with purchase orders, the widescreen version. Now we've added an option under there. So let's go look at that guy. So go to purchasing, work with purchase orders. There's the widescreen version of it. We continue to do things on the traditional screen version, but our intentions are to add new features to the widescreen versions. Obviously, the traditional ones are becoming less and less used. We can actually look on your system and see what, which, how many day, you know, how many days out of the year, or how many days since the last install and the last date used for some of these objects. And at some point, we will probably start to retire some of those when they're no longer in use. Uh, but we're trying to, you know, we don't want to upset our customer base. We don't want to upset the Apple cart. So we're trying to judiciously step through these changes. So here's the widescreen version of this. And I don't think we've done a, we haven't done an F2 expander for this one, but boy, that would be maybe some more useful information we can put on a secondary line down here. So suggestions, thoughts, we, we welcome them. No F2 yet on here, but what was added is, all right, we've always had this F8. Show me all the items that have been involved in a purchase order. That, this is the F8, okay? 
So it's a way to see, basically it's like the F8 and work with current orders where you can find an item and find every instance of that item and what happened on it. And that's what this traditional screen has been. This other wrinkle to added recently as a suggestion from a new customer is the F24, show me received items. So F8 shows you everything, whether this the purchase order just got created, whether it's it's already, uh, you know, it hasn't been received yet, whereas F24 is a little more focused as far as what it shows. So I'm gonna press Shift F12 and get to this screen. And now these are only things that are received. And so sometimes if you're looking at items, and I, I think they were, the suggestion was that they use this as a way to sort of police what's being received and to, to, to look at things from that perspective without to drill into a bunch of things. So I believe it's gonna be very useful for people to put a received date in here, say 316.21, looks like a date down there. And so everything that was received on a particular date, um, we show the unit, well, we're showing the quantity we're on order, the quantity that was actually received, the unit value for each of those, the extension, the, the date that was involved, you know, the unit of measure that was in there. This is cases, but you know, it might be a circumstance where you're buying sometimes cases and boxes. Whatever it is, it's going to show up from the line. Up. It shows the disposition of this. this. These were sent to accounts payable. Here's the vendor that was involved. PO number and so forth. So pretty straightforward, but we think that you will find a use for that. Receiving department, purchasing department, let us know. Let us know how you use it. That's what makes us work on hopefully the right things is people telling us life would be simpler if you just did this. All right, so I think we're getting close. We've got about 20 minutes left. And I, really, I, you know, the question and answer session, I, I don't know how that's going to work with this many people on the call. It, it may be a little chaotic. So I urge you, if you have questions or suggestions or complaints or cheers or jeers or whatever it happens to be, or you want to send Aiden a case of beer or Mark, <laughs> we can do that offline. So, but let's just jump ahead. I think we're coming to the close here. Uh, customer price retail book. All right, I'll just talk about these. Customer price retail books, CPRB, is you know when you go to the customer price retail book option that every I think almost everybody knows about, uh, where you can actually render prices, specific prices for a specific customer, and it outputs a CSV file. And somebody had suggested that we put the customers. Um, unit level retail at the end of that CSV file. So that was added in February. Some people have that patch installed in their system. Many do not, but if you need that and that's important, you let us know. Uh, the buyer can now be used in global tools to mark pre-books for export. This was a request from a longtime customer. So let's just jump over to that's end of the world. And let's look at pre book global tools. I'll press F2 for tool. So accessible from multiple spots. And now you can use, if you're want, wanting to export pre books and you're doing, or you're wanting to mark things and change them, and you, you, it needs to be, the buyer needs to be a filter, a qualifier for it, you can do that now. Uh, people found that useful. We've, we've been doing work on this screen little by little too, uh, where you can do multiple things like you can use it to update the user codes. You can actually change the user codes, but you have to, you know, you want to filter things with the qualifi uh, qualifying parameters at the top. And if put user codes and they're defined, it will show you a description out here beside that. They don't have to be defined. People use those for uh, ad hoc purposes or whatever makes sense to them. But you, so you, those codes, but we were continually doing little tweaks and things to this piece of the system, the pre-books, because people 
do things and, and it's a changing landscape out there for people doing pre-books as well based on uh, market think requests. Let's see, I think there was another. There is a system option. Oh, I had a lot of stuff left to go here, so I better speed up. VR deals. I was just talking about, so you, you have the, the buyer on there and knowing that you can use that. The VR deals, you can now put a negative value in there. Here's the use case for that. Uh, we had a customer come to us, they said, we're ordinarily given a good price, but for certain deals, we actually want to raise the price instead of give a discount. And so what we did was we allowed it now where if you key a negative value, first of all, say for instance, it's a B type of VR deal. And you say, ordinarily you think, well, that's 50 cents off or a quarter off, but maybe you want to be to add uh, an amount to the pro customer's price, then you can put a negative value in there. And so it adds that to it. And so it supports all the way down through the system. So kind of a rare circumstance, but it might, you might find a use for that because remember a VR deal, you can choose certain customers to, to uh, enroll in that. So maybe not on a global basis, but maybe a certain circumstances that might be a beneficial way to do that. Let's see there to gently increase slow moving items carried for specific accounts. That was that was the uh, use case that came to us for that. Uh, heads down PO entry, you can now enter a manufacturer part number. I'm going to show us a couple things over here on the purchasing side. That was heads down. So let's jump into VO. Let's zoom into it. Let's press F5 for quick entry, which we refer to in house as a heads down entry. And so you get in here. So traditionally you're doing it this way, but maybe you know, if you're if you're if you're building up your PO and you're doing it the traditional way because you've gone gone maybe to a cigarette manufacturer's website and you have to do it on their site because that's the way they uh, handled it up to now, but maybe if I want to toggle my entry mode, then you can enter their part number, their their item number for it, and use that method to enter. So the F6 just jumps you back and forth between those methods. And also, while we're still over here in this area of the woods, uh, we added a warning when you're canceling a PO. Hoop you do. I mean, I say hoop you do. It's not a lot to look at, but if you go to cancel one and you put the, your uh, C on the wrong line, there could be regrets. And we force it to default to blank. So you have to respond. And I'm going to say, no, I don't want to continue. That was a mistake. So that is a feature. And moving ahead, all right, the whole, we've sent out emails and stuff about the uh, pre-book import, and I, and I don't really have anything I want to show on here. We have separate uh, uh, things that we've shared with people as far as how to format that. A fair amount of uh, distributors are doing, uh, getting the information, signing up to the process with Altria to get the data, uh, and then building your pre-books out of that data that comes through there, through our the web portal that we had that we built in conjunction uh with with the uh, Altria because they they wanted this to be done and I'll let you guys know the DAC customers plus CDR supply logic customers makes a pretty good chunk of the domestic market for Altria so it made sense for them to to uh, come to CDR and us work together to help each other in turn to, to help the distributor that's that's what we're trying to do and uh Phase two of that rolled out where you can actually go where you would have to go back to their site and put in the uh, the purchase order numbers and things of like that in phase two. And that's a separate uh, set of documents that you have to sign with Altria. And I think a lot of people are in the, the mix of doing that. So I just wanted to mention that for anybody that wasn't aware that that whole thing goes on. We do charge a very nominal subscription fee because we have to host this thing in the cloud and we've done all the API work and so forth. So there are literally hundreds, if not thousands of people hours in the project already, just from CDR alone, not including the Altria team of people. So wanted to mention that. 
moving ahead, option to block a customer from canceling any order. If you're worried that somebody is playing games and doing monkey business, I'm just going to show you where that works. So, and we have a less than 15 minutes, but I think it's important to kind of show things uh, because we can always talk offline about stuff. So let's just show you where that stuff is controlled. If I go over to users, I mentioned before, if you're going to enable somebody for widescreen, this is where you'll want to have an entry set up. So I'm going to go to harder. Here's my entry in here. You don't have to have an entry in here, but you probably want entries in here for each of your users. Most things will function without it. It's You can tailor the behavior of the system by doing this. So I'm going to edit my entry with a two. Uh, I could associate an, a salesperson number or buyer ID or something like that. You're not going to do that. This is that widescreen thing I'm talking about. But what I want to show here for the cancellation, which is kind of a tucked away hidden thing, if you press F20, and we don't publish this because um, not everybody needs to know some of this information, although I know I'm showing it here. And we may edit this out on our YouTube post. Um, but block order cancellation. You'll see on here it says, don't allow them to cancel it. And that means don't allow them to cancel it if it's already been picked or invoiced. But it doesn't block them if it's still open. And we had distributors come to us and say, we have certain personnel that we don't want to allow them to cancel anything. And so not showing on the screen is the value always. Looking like that. And so remember, I'm Harland. And I'm always blocked. So let's go put that to the test. Find an order here that's open. Cranky corner. I've been beating on them a lot. I'm going to cancel them. And so I'm going to do a nine, which is the, no, C, pardon me, is cancel. Cancel. This user cannot cancel orders at an open or higher status. So there you go. I'm blocked. And so if you need that function, that's where you do it. I'm going to go and re-enable myself. If I go to the right spot here. And now I have, this sky is my limit. I can do anything, oh, sort of. Uh, let's see, native value. Okay, we talked about. Oh, okay. When before we talked about the putting a negative value in for a VR deal to actually raise the price instead of discount. Well, an afterthought to that was the cost offsets that appear down at the bottom. Say, so how, how do you want to affect net or base, or do you want to affect them at all? And now they support negative values as well. So just, that's a piece of that whole puzzle. Um, after we did the initial thing and the customer uh, distributor was using it, they said, oh, what about those cost offsets? Because that's we, we definitely want to reflect that in the same way. So that's what that is. Customer options. Here's a scenario for you. Um, I have a store, physical location. They changed ownership. Because I want to keep everything under the old customer number that they did, now the same location, but it has a different customer number because I want to leave everything intact in case they get audited, in case there's a lawsuit, whatever, there's a place now to store the previous customer number when you set up that new account. So let's just show you that real quick. Now I'm talking faster and faster. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you go over to customer options and you go to that second screen page down. So if I set up a new customer number for the same ABC store, but they have new ownership and I want to build a relationship in here between what that old customer number was, that's where you do it. Does it do anything else beyond that? Not at this point. It's informational. If you're popping queries, doing things like that, but at least you have a place to store that. And that was a suggestion from a good customer. Uh, they're all good customers. That was a suggestion from a customer that frequently brings things to our attention. Pre-book export option and SIS 015, let's just look at that quickly. So system options. And I believe it's on here somewhere, where is it?
now. Where is that value stored? I'm not going to search for, but uh, according to this, and, and this does work because it because it is in use. But there's an option on here, and I just may not have that on the test system under system option 15 record to block a pre-book export of an item that doesn't have a location assigned. It must have a pick location assigned to it if you enable that. Um, that particular customer was having some pain because they were exporting things that were, a lot of things that were exporting were, uh, were things they were buying from another supplier, things that they didn't really stock, so they didn't have a location, but, and then they were exporting the pre-book, yet the warehouse crew had not put a place for it. it was Things were exporting, they were not getting onto the order. That's what that's built to address. It's just an option to, to block items from exporting if they don't have a location. Um, if you have a super item that's parent item or detail controls price, super item doesn't need a location. Only the items inside of that are, you know, the actual items that are going to be picked need a location if you enable that option. Uh, another one just to talk about quickly. Credits coming in from the field. This is a, a combination that we had not run into, but people would send in a credit from the field. And yet they had auto picking turned on. So as soon as that order came in, it would kick out to a pick list. Well, it was kicking out, the, it was taking the credit, not kicking out to a pick list, but changing the status on it to picked. And so that's just relaxes that. And that was, as you can see, an October thing, just a strange combination of uh, environment things that was addressed. The item ranking. Uh, we've had item ranking in the system that ranked by retail units, um, which is not ranking by dollar base, but ranking for the way the retailer would view that as far as the number of retail units they might be moving potentially out of what they purchased from the distributor. That's what that is. Uh, just an extra piece of information is in there. That goes into a CSV file as well. You can unapply transactions now. and um, uh, vendor receivables, that's been a long-standing request. And uh, so before, you, you, there was a clunky workaround way to do it, but now you can actually go to a transaction. If you're using true vendor receivables where you actually are keeping track of payments that come in, you're applying those to a vendor invoice that was done, but you made a mistake and you need to un unapply, now you can do that in a simple way by doing a U beside it. Don't need to show that. And there's a number of things on here for returns management, which is an optional module that is used a lot. And I'll just, there is a way, and I'll just discuss these briefly since we only have five minutes left in the session. Uh, there's a place to indicate if you have a lot of reason codes, which a lot of people do, but maybe when somebody's keying in a pickup request and we only want to permit them to use up to 10 specific reason codes that apply to a return, there's a place to identify those. And this explains how to do that. If they go to key one in and you've identified some restricted, some reason codes you want to restrict to, then if they key anything that's not on that list of 10, they're out. And you don't have to have 10. You can have one, two, 10. If they're all blank, things operate just like they do now. Um, you can email a pickup request. From returns management. That is a function that was added in February of this year. Um, a, re a warning and returns done from about this time last year, actually you've been out there for a while, but didn't make the last release. When you're they're scanning, checking in a return, and the unit of measure being scanned doesn't match what was on the pickup request, it's going to say, hey, guess what? Might be a problem here. Pay attention. Uh, work with credit requests. This is one that I actually talked to uh, a CDR person this morning about. It was a request uh, that we were able to supply to a uh, distributor that was actually done last year when we were preparing uh, our release, but hadn't. Uh, so we were in the, it was kind of caught in the middle of that process where if a credit has been actually produced on the work with credit request screen it now it shows you the actual credit memo and the date that that was done so that will be handy for people i'm sure of that uh you can exclude commissions let's see if i can pull this up 
this down. Oops, no. You can exclude commissions being generated if things fall below a minimum order profit value, and that's a system option that you can set up. Uh, positive pay version, there's version five for different banks. That's for the accounts payable side. Um, when you do statements by call route, if you do those, you you can run it for a call route, but you can exclude a certain statement code if you have things mixed in to that batch. Uh, you can do an apply reset now, and that will uh, that will affect history transactions as well, as long as all the pieces involved in that uh, that uh, apply reset are still in AR history. So if they're archived out, it's not going to do that. So that's a new feature that was. Uh, added in February of this year. Um, you can, we've added a warehouse restrictor as you probably might have noticed that on the display co corporate and customers for AR. And I think my final screen here is web option. This is another option module, but we are changing the look and feel of the different things. Web option, so you'll know, is the piece that we need to use to serve up web pages for DAT Connect. Rachel Manager, DAC Delivery Manager, and a couple of other a couple of other things. And so we're we just in case you get the stuff and install it, so there's a background page where we're doing a refresh on those pages. But that's this is not the um, not the venue to talk about those because those are optional modules. And I have come to the end of my presentation. It's going to be a long recording, and we're not really going to have time for q and I apologize for that. Uh, let us know. Give us feedback by email. If the Q&A is more important uh, than content, we'll do that. But this has been a full two hours of content. I pray that they recorded properly. We sure hope so. Otherwise, we'll be going back and doing these individually to put on YouTube. Our next scheduled quarterly What's New in DAC will Tentatively set for January the 19th, 10 a.m. Central. We will be sending save the date information on that. They will be shorter sessions when we start, probably an hour in length and more possibly more focused. We appreciate feedback on what those um, presentations should comprise. Having said that, I'm going to um, end this meeting. And I sure hope I, I want to thank everybody for taking time out of your day to look at that. I hope you saw at least one thing that is going to be useful for you. That's our, that's our hope. We hope that you saw a lot of things that you like. Um, let us know. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time today. Goodbye.